I'm going to slowly start my talk. Welcome everybody to Italang Haskell for JVM. Actually, I didn't knew that the the title will be cut and we'll make a little bit of mystery what's, what's about this, yeah? I've seen this confusion. And even people were like surprised that someone is going to talk about ETA on this conference and they haven't seen that. But okay, the first question is who knows what ETA is more or less? Who have heard about it? Okay, cool. That's, that's already cool. And who has done ever, anything with ETA like writing programs, contributing to it? Ooh, not. Oh, you! Actually, uh, not directly, but I did give them some advice for the Gradle plugin. Great, oh cool. That I, I've seen that they, they, they are doing that. I don't know how, how good is that at the moment. Can you tell? Uh, no, I just gave them some advice on how to, on the API around the, how to declare the dependencies. So, the, the, actually this talk it will be about to think to show you the ITA and show you uh, how that you can do a lot for this. Because this is a new project, relatively, and I think it's very useful for a lot of, it kind of could be something really good for a lot of poor developers, but okay, let's start the story. So, uh, actually the, the, this is the ETA logo that you should remember. This is the, this kind of dragon and ETA Lang, yeah, so, uh, and about, about me. My name is Jarek Ratajski uh, and that's I still love C Commodore 64. I, I actually last week we made it running with my colleagues of the old Commodore. It's like so cool. Finally, real programming. Uh, there is no Haskell for it as far as I know, but we'll try to do something. And I'm an architect at Ingenious GmbH. If you don't know who is an architect, I work for uh, big customers like banks and they have a lot of architects that basically set the rules for developers that if you have any so many rules that basically, you know, they co that, that cover everything and every line of your code, you can't really do anything anymore because it's like everything is like kind of forbidden. So I am the guy fighting those guys and mostly successfully. If you are ever in such environment hostile, hopefully not, then yeah, call me. <laughs> That's right, well, okay. So I am Java developer with like since 1999, really, uh, with a functional heart. So I really do crazy things with Java. I will show you that. So, but it's not about me, it's about uh, ETA and Haskell. So, why, why bother bringing Haskell to JVM? So, the, the thing is that a lot of people love it. It's a really cool language. And the problem is, however, that, yeah, when you, when you just look what's done in the big banks, whatever, the, oh, this business for Haskell is still growing, but majority of now, mainstream developers, even if they ca could try it, even if, even if do they like Haskell, they are basically faced with, faced with those guys. Sorry, we only do Java here. In the best case, JVM. But is this means that why, for instance, Scalaware is so popular because it's a, at least a little bit almost good functional programming language. Still not Haskell, but it's okay-ish. So. But the JVM itself isn't that bad. If you, a lot of people are surprised how powerful it is. So for instance, like uh, it was even 20 years ago already quite powerful, but you can see, because a lot of people think that there's a byte code that's interpreted because of that it's slow. So of course, this is absolutely not true. Java is not an interpreted language. Basically it's compiled only at the runtime. Mostly, so this is, this is uses, uh, using just-in-time compilation, and because of that, it can do a lot of things that a static compilation can't do. That for it can do, for instance, aggressive inlining. It's like it really analyzes which parts of code are used and tries to inline as big functional as possible, as uh, as long as it fits good to caches. Really, it can really fit it act to the actual architecture of the machine. It does things like escape analysis. It means basically like uh, it sees which objects really are escaping the function, which are only uh, uh, actually can, could be allocated on stack because they don't escape the function. A lot of escape analysis covers a lot of parts, and it makes uh, JVM pretty pretty fast. Also uses all the registers and stuff you have on a machine. So you, if you compile to the bytecode, it actually the program it might be faster when the Oracle or other company uh, releases the new version of JVM and they, for instance, see that, oh, now everybody has those yeah, SIMS registers for XXX 
AE, as you know, or other, and JVM actually uses them. So I, uh, there is a star there because this, uh, I don't know who knows this SIMT instructions in Intel. So it's like for vector, like m multiplying more things at once with registers. So Java, it uses them for a long time, but only recently it started to use them really correctly, really in a vector-oriented way. And it's still not, not perfect. It's far from perfect, but it's getting better with every version. So it's like, and there are like really decent garbage collector coming in with each version of JDK, like now it's the JDK 10, it becomes faster. I, so I have a couple of benchmarks and I'm really like sometimes surprised that they really will get, get faster with every version, even though the speed wasn't bad. And if, if there is even good breakthrough coming, uh, they introduced a new just-in-time compiler. So there was, for long years, there was something called Hotspot, and it was written in C++. It was, it was good, but now they did something crazy. Inside of Java, you have a compiler. What is a compiler? Basically, this, this thing that just-in-time compiler that analyzes the bytecode, finds which functions are mostly used, and compiles them as, as good as possible to the native code. And basically, this is very important because it compiles only those functions that are really, really used. It analyzes which branches are mostly used, etc. So it first gathers. So Java is kind of slow when you start a program. If you do something like a program for bash in Java, this is typically wrong because this will be very slow. Java is mostly designed to do server things that like work for days or months. And it's for the first couple of minutes, okay, depends on what you do, it just gathers statistics, which, which, which methods are called, which branches in ifs, and then after that, it compiles better, better. There are like multiple stages. And this compiler was written in C++, which was and like 20 years ago. It wasn't really maintainable, and recently they <laughs> did a crazy thing. They rewritten this compiler in Java. So Java has a compiler inside written in Java, and it's even funny if you run it. For instance, you can use something like print compilation to see which methods, which functions are really compiled at this moment by Java. You can see, have kind of debug. It starts by compiling itself. This is so cool. <laughs> it makes Java even slower by the startup, but then the programs, because th those algorithms right now written in Java are quite sophisticated. After all, they are really, they create really, really uh, fast programs. Okay, so, but this was about, all about that we have JVM that is cool, but people just, well, they would love to write in Haskell. And there is a solution that, for instance, I was doing this solution. You can write basically Haskell in any language. This is a kind of theorem. So I was writing, people are, were laughing that I'm writing Haskell with Java, which typically looks like that. At, at the end, you have a flat, not flat, not flat, but it, it looks awful. But it's, you can do that, and modern Java programming looks like that. So you, you use functional programming with Java. It's, it's not very OK, but it works. <laughs> so there's a better solution that's been tried for a long time, right, Haskell using Scala. And it, this is even a funny story. I was trying to find really crazy piece of code in Scala that was like mimicking uh, uh, Haskell. So in Scala, they have this Scala Z, a uh, library that mimics more or less Haskell. And I found this code, and later I found the, the guy that just uh, <laughs> contacted me. Oh, you used my code <laughs> on, the, on the, this was from the GitHub. Okay, but OK, it's like one other solution, which is better. And this is the, uh, probably the best solution, like write Haskell using Haskell. Wow, yeah, it's like, why not? And then deploy to JVM, why not? And even glue it with Java, because Java has a lot of these libraries that you could use. This is something not to forget, because basically whatever you want to do from graphic to, to network, whatever, there is, it's, there is surely something in Java that's quite, typically quite decent when it comes to quality. And okay, so there's a company called TypeLead, and they, uh, it started like, I don't know, a year ago. They tried to solve the problem by creating a ETA language, which is basically Haskell, you can just call it Haskell, and for the JVN, and provide commercial support for it. This is also important for all of these banks. They need a commercial support. So if they if they do something, so ETA is an open source project. You can use it, but you the in the future, I think it's not yet ready. Uh, the company was created to provide for those you know big big players uh, commercial support. And by the way, I'm not associated with TypeLead at all. I just, I'm just a normal developer that evaluated it because I'm this unlucky guy writing Haskell with Java. And whatever I say here uh, might be 
a little bit wrong because I don't know everything, I don't know the plans. I, I, I'm in contact with the developers, I occasionally ask them uh, how it's looking, what are the new features, but it's like I have no, absolutely no, uh, let's say, uh, internal information and I am really not, actually absolutely not a good Haskell developer. I learned Haskell while evaluating ETA. So I, before I could do some simple programs, but I really, really Haskell I learned, learned a couple of months ago. On the other hand, I'm quite okay. I have 20 years of experience with Java. So I, from the Java point of view, I can explain it quite well. From, from Haskell point of view, I don't know. Maybe I Probably I, there is a lot of stuff still. I don't know. I'm still a beginner. So, and uh, to not to remember, no, not to forget is ETA is not yet finished. The version, actual version is like, uh, the, the version that it's uh, currently uh, there, it's like 0 0.8. It was just released yesterday. I'm already using that. And it's, uh, yeah, so, and it more or less shows where the product is. And why is ETA so special? So did anyone hear about something like other uh, Haskell for JVM? Frege. Frege, there is exist. So, what's wrong with Frege? Who knows? It's not quite how work. <laughs> okay, this is okay. So, there's nothing wrong with Frege. This is. I was looking at this project since the beginning, so I was playing with a really. I can't tell you much about Frege because I never did anything bigger, uh, but. I played with that, I was seeing how this project was evolving, and at the beginning it had some limitations, but it eventually it became mature. And it is quite okay Haskell, there is not, this, is, this is just Haskell working for JVM. This is, there are no like simplifications, whatever. The only problem with Frege, this is the Haskell, that it's not compatible with GHC. Because GHC is like, a, this is also a Haskell. But it's like industry standard at the moment. If you think about like writing a real code in Haskell, wherever, typically you mean GHC, which means a Haskell as a language with a lot of extensions, etc. and etc. These things you don't have in Frege, for instance. And what is Frege trying to fill the gap is providing something that is as much compatible with GHC, exactly with the leading standard for JVM. So there are, I will be uh, talking later about this Frege also a little bit, uh, but this is the most critical feature of uh, ETA, be as close to GHC as possible. And how, why is that? Because they've chosen the easy way. It's kind of a backend for GHC. What does it mean? Who knows this? STG machine. Yeah, there was a great session yesterday which was mentioning this. So, so can you explain what's that? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, I I don't really read that well, but although I had to for a few moments, some few times. So this is like intermediate language, which is like minimal functional programming language, almost a lambda calculus, almost like pure lambda calculus, and it's like uh, in a compilation of GHC. First, what they do. They just analyze, they build this abstract syntax tree from Haskell, and they basically the sugar it to the point it is this STG. So it's one and one point in a compilation you have this, this very, very verbose program, but this is like minimal, minimal functional language. And basically Haskell can, can be thought of some kind of, uh, sorry, just, oh, I went too far. Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, STG machine. Okay, so Haskell can be thought of kind of like mm, <coughs> sugar on top of STG machine. It's, it's not actually the sugar, but it's like uh, actually the, uh, this is in the first step compiled to STG. What STG provides, this is a very important feature. It already, it's not only like minimal lambda calculus language, it al also provides a means for uh, tile core recursion, that which is really like critical feature for, uh, for uh, other functional language. And that's basically this. And as you see, this is typically generated from Haskell code, so the symbols are not like really read readable, but there is even a way to decipher, decipher it. So yeah, that is spineless, tagless G machine. We won't elaborate a lot on, a lot on that, but what is really cool about uh, this STG is kind of like bytecode or LVM for Haskell. And first phase, Haskell to STG, 
uh, ETA basically forked from GAC. This is like the same code. If you looked at the code of GAC and the ETA, it's mostly forked. This is the same. It is forked from version 7, which is also important. Uh, because now they have new version of GHC version 8 for a couple of months. So, And the second phase is STG to bytecode. So normally in a GHC you have a STG to native code, okay, also to some kind of other bytecode in GHCI or uh, even to this LLVM right now. But in, 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 ca in case of ETA, this is compiled to bytecode for a JVM. So that's how they achieve the great compatibility. And finally, the bytecode. This is like, who knows Java bytecode more or less? So yeah, there are people. So this actually, if you have spent a lot of years in Java, you can really read it. And it's, this is very simple. This is one of the simplest basic assembly languages. You can, it is really easy. You have, you have uh, only, uh, this is like operational stack go to and everything. This is a very easy language with not many symbols. This is kind of assembly, simply. Okay, so what's, What's the cache here? It's like the GHC uses native calls. You can easily use uh, call the C libraries, C functions, and they are used a lot in base packages. And in, in fact, a lot of code in, in GHC uses C imports. So this is the, one of the problems. And what ITA does is basically they rewrite all those original calls to C to the to the Java calls. So basically because like stdlib in C forms like kind of environment you can use, the basic functions, and it's like in base packages for GHC they are used, like for instance in the float definition, this is from base from Haskell, from, from GHC. And if you look at the same code in ETA, you see that it is like one-to-one -one mapping to Java import, because JVM also forms kind of an environment with all of those basic functions that you would need. So can you go back to the previous slide? Of course. The Java safe, uh, unsafe stuff is pretty scary if you get any random code in there. So that's the scary part for me. Uh, what, 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 what would you mean by uh, if any, you have any? If you write, because it's doing an unsafe in there, now your JVM tries to keep you in a safe environment, right? Mm -hmm. In the JVM. So okay. If you have, and in Haskell, you can link to pretty much any C code or any other language code. But okay, this is like, we have ETA, and it all works on JVM in a safe environment, and this unsafe here, yeah. this is, the, the meaning of this really is that while calling this Java, uh, assume there are no like side effects, this is no blocking. Right. Yeah. This is only this, and this is basically the same as you do here. But this is nothing like being unsafe on the platform. This is only for Haskell, Actually, this is only the definition for GHC, for like for ETA, sorry, to uh, because with safe, uh, what would be, we would have here in importing something like Java Monad, which I will call, cover later, basically. So this, this means you can safely call it because it's not blocking, it's just a simple function, doesn't do any real side effects that you should worry about. So what about functions? Uh, C imports that do have side effects, because the Haskell okay. do have them. I will show that, okay? Later. Uh, the, there is, uh, I will simply tell you Java Monad. There is something like this. Okay. <laughs> okay, so also important part, nowadays if you write any bigger project, typically you just don't do everything from scratch. You use a lot of libraries from Hackage, which is like kind of repository, for, if you don't know, repository for libraries in Haskell. That's basically in any serious program you would use uh, some of them. And this is kind of a standard for GHC. Okay, this is only a couple of them, A and B letters, as you see. So there are a lot of them for every kind of a category you would think of. So yeah. And what ETA tries to do is able, enable you to use those hackage packages. How? Normally, if, it's, if the hackage package is written in Haskell, there's nothing to do. You just can use it. If it has C imports, then it's a problem. And what they do, they provide the patches. This is like separate project, which basically for each of the hackage package that it's in use. So nowadays, there are, I don't know how many are co covered at the moment, but with every week that happen, there are new. We, if the package has some C imports, they provide a patch 
how to rewrite those C imports to Java. This exactly looks like this. This is a GitHub project, so if you, if you are in a situation you are going to use some hackage package and it doesn't have this, this is pretty straightforward what you have to do to change it. So even make a pull request, that is how you can help easily and basically tell how to rewrite it. Uh, you might see that it's not very scalable because it even affects which lines in which version. Uh, yes, indeed, so it's not perfect solution, but it's like kind of a pragmatic that works at the moment. Maybe they will have something better for the future, but at the moment that's what, how it works. And I already i am surprised how many of the packages are there, so it's not bad. And last but not least, okay, I don't know, maybe this su it supports all this, you know, crazy extensions basically because this is the first phase it mostly they are using this first phase from uh, haskell to stg so that's cool so the statement is simply is as close as you can get with haskell on jvm it's like so that's really makes it different from frege and other implementation and i already tried and people tried a lot of crazy codes that are using ghc and Typically, you are very lucky if you try to run co code that has a couple of files with mm, with uh, usage of hackage. You might you, there is a great chance even at this moment with not really finished program uh, project it would work. So now let's talk about optimization, how it works, because a lot of people say it's impossible to do functional language on the JVM, especially people involved in a Scala compiler say that. That because it was really hard, and it's still hard. You see that it's leaking. That the, the, the JVM is not really cool platform for for that kind. But the the thing is that oh come on, is assembly language really friendly for uh, functional languages? Like, and the bytecode is really not that different from assembly. So the thing is that if you try to be very close that your function in a language is a function on JVM, a method that's the Scala way more or less then you have the problem. But if you just think of bytecode as kind of assembly and you don't worry about functions, objects, you just emit assembly, then you simply do the, the same thing as GHC does on a native code. So you basically generate any assembly and forget about methods. So this is the why it works. And let's look at the tile core optimizations. So first of all, this is like naive Fibonacci. Of course, everybody has seen that. The problem with this, it can't be optimized. Why? This is recursive version. Why, why we can't optimize this easily in a, in a language? Even in normal Haskell, it's not really optimized as far as I know. Haskell what? Haskell does OK, oh, this you, you would give you. In this case, OK. Uh, I'm not sure how ITA does it. Uh, this is a good question. I don't know. But the big, biggest problem here, you, this is not really tail call friendly, because you have two calls. Yeah, so, but it's possible to rewrite it. Uh, okay, sorry, 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 just a moment. Uh, we'll re go back. I switched. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Again, sorry, it's, <laughs> my my pointer is not friendly for that presentation. So, sorry, sorry, it's like this was the place I was, and we go up. Okay, so the friendly version of Fibonacci, okay, I will try to be with that. Friendly version of Fibonacci can be rewritten like that. With, this is like just a uh, way to only make one call, like define other function that takes sum and presum, let's call it this way. So we'll check, oh yeah? Does the JVM have tail call optimization? So no. no, and there is a great, okay. However, there's a discussion about it. So uh, the recently they think that it might actually provide it, but it's, as long as it's not, we, as I said, it becomes more crazy good in the new versions. They are already thinking about value types and things like that. Uh, we'll see, maybe in two years it will have, but at the moment not. So JVM does not, and if we write the same in Java, this would be the same in Java, how many calls it would like, it can survive. How do you think? How many iterations? Which n can I use as a maximum? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So it depends. Yeah, exactly. That's the best cool, uh, best answer. Is uh, it depends, but on the standard uh, stack size, which you can, by the way, 
uh, change, it's like 10,000 iterations. It's like, this is like, uh, it's not that bad, actually. So this is, uh, OK. So if we, so I tried the same with ETA to see if it survives more than 10,000 on the standard JVM, that would be like, and then later I tried to analyze the code. The thing is that I've written this code, I run it, and I got this result. Uh, what do you think about it? <laughs> ah, this is like, like probably the one of the worst Fibonacci sequences you have ever seen. <laughs> yeah. So the thing is that at the moment I was starting to play with ETA, I was at that level of Haskell. What, sorry. So do you see an error here in the code? OK, I will tell you one thing. Because I was thinking I must have made an error, because I was really the beginner of that. Like, this was like the end of the last year. And uh, or OK, that was even in June. And I was writing only this type of Haskell codes for like last five years, only doing small puzzles. And uh, so I was like trying to find uh, the error for, like, I don't know, one hour, until, unless, until the moment I tried it with GHC. And it provided me the good answer, the normal, actually. So the thing was that ETA, ETA was wrong. And I reported an error. But then something strange happened. The guy, the main developer, kept on asking me if I can reproduce and find out what's there. So it was a really funny story, because ETA is written in Haskell. And I was like analyzing Haskell, learning the Haskell, trying to where the bug is. The only thing that was helping me, I'm really good at bytecode. So the part of analyzing the bytecode, finding what's, what's there wrong, was easy. And then trying to find how this bytecode was, was, was generated was kind of a crazy for me. There is, for instance, they use something like code gen monad, code generation monad. It was like, oh, come on. I was even scared using the IO monad. I knew what is this, but I was never used to that. I was having a problem. But you know what? Then this happened. The, the main developer was helping me. You can even see this story, how it's hel he's helping me. And I could, I could solve the bug. It was like so, for me, so cool. And I really, while solving this bug, I really, I would say, finally learned Haskell to the point I became kind of like, mm. Not, not really good, but good enough to be comfortable with the language. So finally, because the bug was like with these assignments, so there were the, the problem was, this is a typical problem if you do swap. Oh. If you do A to B and B to A, you have to provide some in, yeah, in temporary. Here, this kind of problem, so analysis of, a, of the graph has to be solved. And actually, the, this implementation was covered in the, in the normal GHC from STG to, to the native code. And more or less, the same code had to be ported to ETA because there was some simplification made. Uh, however, I must say, that, those kind of bugs, so I, until this moment, I uh, stepped upon uh, like three this type of bugs. And the thing is, those mostly happen if you do, kind of, do some kind of a crazy benchmarking. If you do typical code, like even looks complicated, it just works perfectly. But if you do some you know, crazy benchmarking, it might still, you might still get some crazy results. So the answer finally after fixing is how much ETA stands. How do you think? OK. I think what? I think you gave up waiting. OK, I, this, uh, I didn't get your answer. You don't know because you gave up waiting. Okay. Okay, I didn't. I didn't. Okay. Basically, like million stands. Uh, you could do more. I I I've, I could, didn't analyze why not like three millions. I, I there is still a limit, but probably it's about integers or something like that. I don't know. But it's like million is not a problem. So it's cool. Uh, it's it's really working. And the code, by the way. So if you've analyzed this code. It was really a while loop there. This, was this, this, this function was transferred to the while loop. So it means there was really tail call optimization done. So it's really working. Cool. OK. So there is other way, of course, if you, if you know trampoline. There is one thing I still don't know, but in, in normal Haskell, you don't really write this trampoline. But they, they provided this trampoline function. And if you rewrite it, the code with Fibonacci, as you see, it's pretty straightforward. With a continuation monad, I won't cover this, but this, there is something like this. So, so that, finally, you don't have to rewrite the Fibonacci to be like tile call friendly with only one call. With a continuation monad, you can still preserve the structure of the code with two uh, calls. And with this trampoline, 
this is built in function in, in ETA, you can still run it and it will not like uh, explode your stack or whatever. So this is like other function uh, thing that is working. Okay, about the, this is only one, I would say this is the was like a boy mern test for the compiler of ETA. If it's, and it passed it finally. <laughs> so it's like, it's doing this TCO. Uh, I did some other benchmark just comparing it to Java where it is in a performance or with other. So let's see. Those benchmarks, by the way, are not very professional. So don't really look at the numbers that much. They were only to show. I'm only showing you more or less where it is yeah, at this moment. So uh, let's see. So this is, for instance, a quick sort. If you do naive quick sort in a ETA, this is one of the beauties of the Haskell this is like this, this on top. Oh, oh, no, my pointer isn't that good. So you see, this is like the best thing about Haskell, how to convince people to use Haskell is how you write the quick sort. By the way, who knows that this is wrong? <laughs> Why is wrong? You don't know. Okay, so this is like, this is giving the perfect results. This works. But officially, it shouldn't be called quick sort, this, this recursive version, because the, by definition, the quick sort is doing the things in memory, so in place, basically in place. It shouldn't, and, and this of course is like creating and allocating more and more lists as you do that. But you see it's very pretty straightforward as a definition of a quick sort. Hopefully in this uh, auditorium I don't have to explain that, I'm sure. <laughs> so the same, however you could do the same in Java, and by the way Java really matured, so this is like Java, I have the left elements, right elements, and I am appending them. And important here, this is not the Java util list. This is not the standard list in Java, which is completely wrong because it's mutable. In all my Java projects, I use an immutable list, which comes from a project called Waver, which is basically like copy of the structures, immutable structures that, there are, that are in Scala by the API, they are very similar. And I'm only using that. So this code behaves more or less as the above. It's really doing a lot of allocations, etc. It's with a functional list. Okay, so this is naive quicksort, but you can also do the real quicksort with ETA if you use something like Vector, which is, by the way, a package on a package that you can use. Vector is kind of a mutable structure that you really and you, as you see, it's not that nice. And you, it really even resembles the old bad C code for quicksort. Really look, looks as, as unfriendly as this one. But this is the real quicksort. This is the real in, in place implementation that you could do with, with Haskell. And this is stolen from some Haskell, um, uh, how to call it, repository. And it perfectly worked without any problem with, in ETA. So this is also the, and this is like a quicksort in Java. I just use the function on a list sort, which, by the way, doesn't really do quick sort. It does mostly something like merge sort with quick sort. It's more complicated, but this was like the fastest sort I could achieve in Java, just to compare where it is in uh, comparing to Haskell, uh, to the ETA. The code is on a GitHub. If you want to see that, maybe there is something not perfect there. Just go there, check it and the results. So in case of naive quicksort, as you see, ETA was slower. This is for me not a surprise, but it was like almost three times slower than the Java. When it came to the real quicksort, which by the way, Java was kind of cheating because it wasn't really written here. It was like built in almost native function. And here we have a fastest implementation in, uh, with vector in ETA. You see it's like 60, 70 percent of a percentage of a speed. So this is like operations per second. So it's not bad. I, I call this result. It's really not bad because it's if, if the language is like two times slower, you can most typically you can still use it because what makes application slow is IO, typically not CPU. If it was like 10 times slower, it would be an issue, but it's not. It's really better than better than uh, like 50 percent. Oh, yeah. We'll compare it to GHC. <laughs> that would be, so there is, <laughs> that's what, where, it, where it becomes interesting. So there is a problem called 12 queens. Don't ask me what's this, but it was posted in fact as a problem for ETA because someone did a measurement of that and ETA mm, was like very, very slow. So I was helping analyzing why, why it was slow. Uh, we found some issues. 
Some of them were fixed, not everything, so there are still a lot of things that can be done to make it faster in ITA, and the results are, uh, first is Frege, so uh, first, it means, uh, first position is Frege, so basically the all implementations gave the same results, this is like 45 seconds it took to Frege. It took 26 seconds to ITA, which is all, but the first results were actually were worse for ITA. So this is like after there were some things fixed. So this is like, first results were like five minutes, really. <laughs> and this is GHC. So as you see here, there, and the star means, this is very important. The star means uh, this benchmark is very unfriendly for Java because it was whole starting of JVM taken into consideration with all this initial compilation, all that stuff. So it means that typically, if it was fair made for Java, you should like extract, I don't know, four or five seconds. Like for still it's worse, but yeah, as you see, so we, uh, it's worse than GHC, but it's not 10, time, 10 times slower like now. It's like, I would say, depends on, your, on the situation. It's not really bad in my opinion. And it's still, there are a lot of, okay, there are a couple of issues in the generated bytecode that we, yeah? Yeah, so here JIT kicks in, but we have this uh, first couple of seconds that we waste. And basically, mm, okay, the thing is, I didn't have a better benchmark for that. And so it uh, depends where, what you measure. There are benchmarks where you could see the full, full, full power of ETAR and JVM, but I, I just used something that in fact was even reported as very unfriendly for ETA. So there are different, there are a couple of benchmarks already on the market that show that ETA is faster than GHC, but I haven't tried them on my own. So you have, basically if you ever see the benchmark, look at it, try on your own and analyze why. <laughs> because here I can tell you why this is slower and there, there are reasons because the bytecode is not perfect. It can be, uh, I would say, in couple of weeks made way faster, but still it is like a lot of to-dos in the ETA. Okay, so I, I would expect it will be like maybe 15 seconds in a month or if, if they like keep on doing like as they do right now. I can't promise anything, but it will be better, surely. Okay, uh, and this, remember this was very unfair for Frege and ETA. And by the way, maybe there was something in Frege, I haven't analyzed that way, made it this slow. I don't know. It is like this was the problem for ETA, in fact, and maybe the frag isn't that bad if you analyze. But typically in a benchmark you should answer the question why it was that slow. And if you know why, then you can trust it. But in this case I, I was only analyzing ETA, why it was slow, and we found something and yeah, and it was partially fixed. So there are other, other benchmarks. This, for instance, for Scala uh, shows some really better results for ETA. I'm not presenting them to you because I haven't really tried it and deeply analyzed. So uh, <laughs> I don't trust anything I haven't really deeply analyzed. So important thing is about Java interoperability. So how do you work with Java? There are basically three styles of uh, how can you work with Java. The first, okay, so before I cover them, this is how you import the Java class. This is a color class from uh, from the Java like uh, graphic uh, library, AWT, the old one, and that you, that way you import the color to the to the ETA to Haskell. Uh, so the class, you can import also functions. This unsafe means yeah, this is the function that doesn't oh actually doesn't do much side effects, but already it produces something like a Java monad. Java monad simply means that we have some type which becomes kind of like this in object-oriented object languages, and this is the result of a function, and means that we are in some like a, a sequential environment where, where the uh, sequence of operations, the order matters. And by by the way, Java monad is very uh, similar to IO monad. You can even convert which, between um, both. Uh, the only difference is that Java monad has this uh, type which means on which class, on which object it is performed. Okay, so yeah, there are like a lot of operations for Java Monad, but this is, if you are programming exactly gluing this with Java, you have to look at it, but it's nothing that strange. Uh, you can also not only import, you can also export the things. Mostly at the moment you can only export things to the static functions, so basically to functions that do not work on any objects. Uh, am I right? Yes. This is, uh, this is this, and 
styles of interoperability. So there are different flavors how you can do that. So first is like completely ignore Java. You just do everything in Haskell. And by the way, in Java, what we typically do are server uh, side programming. So what does it mean? There is something, who knows, servlets. This is like very crazy thing in Java, but basically it's like procedure that takes a request, returns response. You take a request. So what, what is this uh, WAI servlet? It's kind of a wrapper written so that you can use your Haskell functions and use them as a servlet. Yeah, we are out of time? 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay, cool. I, this is, would be almost enough, almost. So, uh, so this is like, let's ignore Java, just if we have, we have written something in Haskell, you want to expose it on Tomcat, all this crazy application server in Java, this is the easy way, this servlet is a wrapper and done. And you are done. And you are stick to, sticking to the, to the Haskell. There is a, a other way, more complicated, I had it, uh, I was showing before this presentation the Pong. So I, I did some Pong game. And this Pong game is on a GitHub in Java. What, what, what I did is uh, all the classes are written in Java. So the, for instance, where is the ball? What is the game state? How many um, scores has a players? And those classes are exported to Haskell. And what's, what does the Haskell does all the manipulations. For instance, if the, if the ball is moving or it's like uh, bouncing from the paddle, all of this code is written in Haskell using the Java structures. So structures in Java, objects in Java, the manipulation in Haskell. This was kind of a tedious. <laughs> uh, oh wait, we don't cover this. This was this implementation. Uh, so this is for instance Java game object ball, ball which, which has a kind of speed and a position, uh, etc. Uh, again, Java object that's serializable to, to JVM. Then I had to write a lot of imports for every method. I had to write an import, for instance, how to set the new position because those like setters and the constructors, uh, everything like that. And finally, like I could use it in a Haskell, like for instance, pushing the new state. So creating a new state of game because the ball is moving and all of that written in Haskell. Interesting thing is that, yeah. Yes, indeed. There is a tool. Uh, it's uh, only experimental at the moment. You can help uh, fixing that <laughs> because there, are, like, there is still to do on that to make it really usable. There is a tool that would scan the Java class and create all those imports for you. So this is, uh, this is the project for ITA. At the moment, it's not yet finished. So uh, funny thing is about this that uh, language really determines how you mm, work with something, how you think. So I had this, in this ca case, I had previously the version of this Pong written in, in Java. And if you see, I had this function that was basically showing how the ball is bouncing from either like player one uh, paddle or player two paddle. And it was like two functions were more or less similar to each other. And I had even this to do. And I should blah, 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 that smart code should reduce both methods to one. I never did it, did this to do. I n never find out how to unify it. So the thing is that in a moment I written it to ITA, I found out, oh, that's perfect place for lenses. It was like this, you know, uh, I would never see this possibility in Java. By the way, you don't have typically like lenses in Java, but after doing that, I know how to write it better, smarter way in Java. It's like <laughs> funny thing. Yeah. So on the other hand, I thought that I'm not really writing. This was kind of a hava. If you look at the definitions of my functions, like always putting the model, like this was really not the Haskell. It was kind of Haskell that was looking almost like Java. So the name for that is hava. It was really, <laughs> but okay, it works. <laughs> yeah, that's this. There is other, other way of writing. So for instance, the, what was tedious and a lot of work is was this cooperating with uh, data structures in Java. Why not having data structures in a, all in Haskell and basically use a Java only as a controller for that? So this would be kind of a similar to the first version. It's almost everything has to do in a Haskell. So the data structure, the controlling, oh, the, the, the manipulation of that, that's like the functions, and only use the Java as like a top level controller of that. So I did even a small project for that, which is the game of life. Uh, just a moment, I will just show you and that it works because it's always better if, you sh if I show something working. So game of life is here. It's like, so this is exactly this project. Uh, just a moment, 
which is completely written in a Haskell. The only part that's not Haskell is this window in like this uh, JavaFX uh, library, which basically what it does, it waits, then calls call, call a Haskell function to generate the new playfield state, and again and again, and then it's, all the drawing is done in Java, all the logic is done in a Haskell, in ETA. So it works, kind of nice pictures, of course. So. Yeah, this is uh, the code for that is on uh, GitHub. So if you want to analyze, ac actually, this was like not very obvious how to do that. Data in Haskell, business logic in Haskell, Java only as a controller. Yeah, this is like you you see the state of the game. Like cell is either dead or alive. Blah, blah, all of this in is typical Haskell code. So you don't smell Java anymore. Okay, so kind of a problem we had summarizing this interoperability. Lots of imports for every single Java class. This will be fix, uh, fixed with this FFI tool, which is not yet finished. Uh, it was complicated how to pass. If I had defined objects in Haskell, I wanted to pass the state of this and then to again pass it back to Haskell, like calculate the new state of the, of the field. This was not really explained in the documentation of ETA. I had to find it out with the help of the developers of ETA. We found it and it works. Uh, other bugs were found, but it, they are fixed right now. Uh, this Java Monad IO Monad, basically, you, j because Java is doing mostly side effect, that's an assumption. So you do all the operations with Java inside of Java Monad. But you can also do with IO Monad, and mostly I would say with IO Monad is easier. It's more intuitive. But uh, we'll see. The documentation, I would say, have to be, has to be like extended to better explain how to use and when which. So ETA versus Fraget, this will be very quickly. I used Fraget very shortly, but it was not really that mature. Recently, I looked at the project. It's really cool. It's really Haskell. The only problem, it's not. The goal of Fraget is not to be close to GHC. It's not using hackers. Yes. Four minutes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Four minutes. I'm really. You, you see this? I'm almost close to the end. <laughs> okay, now the, this is the conclusion from my side. ETA for you. So, at the moment, ETA is not yet, I would say, production ready. I still, if I do some researches, tests, I find smaller on, or bigger bugs. Okay, I would say at this moment I, I only see smaller bugs in the issue list, which is like looking really good at this now, but still there are. Uh, if you think of going to production like soon with ETA, because you are this developer that does something in Haskell and might be forced by the company or this ugly architects to, to do with JVM, you should contact TypeLead. <laughs> Basically, this is they provide commercial support. They they can tell you the conditions and when it is going to be ready. I have no idea. I would, my, my expectation is like half of year to year to, make, to be this really stable. Uh, I don't know. OK, we'll see something later. If you are a Haskell developer and wants to play with JVM, sh impress your colleagues. Because you see, for instance, there is like cool audio library in Java you want to interoperate. You can really. Just port your Haskell and use it, and it, there is you mostly will be lucky. That's not really a problem. It is a lot of fun, so I encourage you to play with that. If you are a Java developer, I encourage even even more. Okay, and this auditorium is not really important, but I am going often to the Java conferences, and I am trying to convince people to write better functional code. And this is really cool for them. Because they, they are still using the old good Java environment, even the tools to some extent, and they, they can do Haskell. It's like being still not that, in not that hostile environment for them. So about ETA community, that's very important. This is a very small community. They have Mostly you can contact them with a Gitter, which is very active. And they are great in helping. So you just write your problem and they answer. You, you just look at this Gitter and you see how, how, how they help. So if you find a bug in ETA, they will just basically give you a hand. And if you have a problem and don't know how to, how to run something, they will help you. And this is like really cool. And they are encouraging you to help them. So like, this is like, how can you be feeling like a hero for almost no cost because they will even tell you what to do and then you are a contributor to it. For, for instance, I am officially even if I did very, very small things. So, but I am happy with that. So 
And there are a lot of small things that you can do, like from the documentation to the tools, even the scanning of Java. This is some very nice code to be written that it's waiting for your help. Really, it's the way you can really help, the, help this to happen. And this is my message. It lies in your hands where it will be. Uh, my personal thing, this is a really important project. I already met people that were exactly in this problem, that they have written like big models in Haskell, some uh, calculations, and they were forced to rewrite it in to Scala or whatever, they were not happy. This is something to make them happy, so basically us. Maybe one of you will be in the future in this problem, who will having this problem, and if you help Ita now, you will not <laughs> be unlucky. Okay, are there questions? Yeah. One question. So in the bytecode that you have seen generated, do you see invoke dynamic being used? Uh, so di invoke dynamic? Yeah. I haven't seen invoke dynamic actually really? there. Because that's how the JVM and, you know, that would be. And all of that but we can analyze if it's maybe they use it now. This is a something I, as far as I remember. I, okay, don't I don't know best answer at this moment because I haven't checked recently. Okay, this is like. Is there a like a parallel runtime system that's equivalent to the one that GHC uses? How is that done? So parallel mean your threads? Uh, no, I just mean like another implementation of the runtime system is used for Haskell. Okay, I don't understand you. another implementation, which means like uh, there's a C runtime system that GHC kind of builds in with your program. It's okay. how execution of Haskell is done for normal GHC programs. Mm -hmm. There's something similar to that here for Ada. Uh, I think it's just a JVM. Right? Yeah, it's just okay, uh, there is even something I forgot. Recently, they created REPL for that. So they like uh, this is not really the answer to a question, but there is a REPL, and uh, but uh, it's only bytecode generated. I don't. So uh, if you meant a JHC that it compiles to LLVM right now or C or bytecode. So, so like for instance, the, the garbage collection does not done. On the, on the Haskell side, right? That's done on the JVM. That, that's the, on the JVM. Right. Yeah. But stuff like laziness and. This is all, okay, if you look at this code, it mostly looks like internal, how the, you will see these tanks and everything, that basically the same as the Haskell is doing inside. So it's like, uh, I haven't shown this, but the, 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 the internal way how laziness works is very similar how, how Haskell works with that. So it's like this more kind of a copy. So. Uh, compiler error messages, do they look like Haskell compiler error messages? This is like, most, most of you see exactly the same compiler errors as from, uh, from GHC, because this part, th they come from this first part to, 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 to STG, so they are the same. Even you have the same, uh, which is important, uh, compiler options. Uh, totally the same. There are some extended only to Java, but mostly the standard works. Ah, I haven't, I haven't, uh, one thing, this is all uses COBOL. If you, you know COBOL for Haskell, this is like build tool. And in, 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 in ITA, they use something which is ITLAS, but basically it, it uses the COBOL files. You can only add some specific things for Java, but this is this. So basically you just use different tool, but it's like COBOL for, so the, again, you are very, very, if you are used, used to Haskell with, uh, with COBOL, then you switch to ITA with ITLAS and you have even the same commands, just. Do you have a GitHub repo? Uh, I, oh, GitHub repo for? For, for your, your code? Okay, I have a lot of repositories I have shown you. Where is this? I have like 52. Some of them are for ITA, but it's. The, oh, the ping pong, uh, the ping pong in ITA, I think it's not yet published because this is something uh, I never had uh, time to clean. What is published is, uh, sorry, is, is this, uh, uh, because that was like, ping pong wasn't that interesting as, uh, for instance, Jarek Ratajski and for instance, if you, what is the search for repositories? Oh, here, ITA, there was somewhere, somewhere search. So there, there we will find this, I would say ITA life is the most interesting how to cooperate with Java because this is really something where I put some uh, in kind of research. How to, this is really interesting how to run the code that's partially written in life, in, in Java partially in Haskell. So, so this one is the one where Java controls the, the Haskell, right? Yes, this is, uh, if I have some time, I'm, Actually, the problem is I have like five, 52 repos, and a lot of them are my ongoing projects. <laughs> so, but this one is finished and working. Like, 